Welcome everyone. My name is Amal Matu, and I'm going to spend some time talking about some important articles from the electrocardiography literature of 2023. I have no disclosures to reveal. Now, for this lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the majority of time focusing on the 2023 literature, but there will be some older topics and some older articles that I'm going to use as a little bit of background to bring us up to 2023 as we go. Uh, this is not going to be a formal journal club. I'm not going to be taking any articles and taking through any p-values. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the background of the study, but instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to present a handful of cases, real clinical cases that we or some other folks have seen. I'm going to talk about how the recent literature can help us move through those articles and also some controversies and challenges as well. So case number one is a 45-year-old man who had presented to an emergency department complaining of some palpitations. Now, as a little bit of background, this is an emergency department from another country where emergency medicine is relatively new as a specialty. The physicians there are trained in emergency medicine and are trying to, try to earn their own respect within this very old school type of hospital, which is very dominated by internal medicine and cardiology. So put yourselves in their shoes. We've all been there before as you're taking care of this patient. The patient had no chest pain, no evidence of acute heart failure, no mental status change, just on and off palpitations all day. And he actually had an episode of syncope with one of these episodes of palpitations. He's got a few cardiac risk factors. He smokes, hypertension, mildly obese. His vital signs are well, blood pressure is good, but his heart rate is 180. So you're gonna get a 12 lead pretty quick. His exam is otherwise unremarkable. And here's your 12 lead. So go ahead, hit your pause button on the video and take a look at this 12 lead and see if you can figure out what's going on. <clears throat> The obvious concern here is ventricular tachycardia versus SVT with aberrant conduction, like SVT may be with a right bundle. That's a common quandary that we face when we see a regular wide complex tachycardia. Now, the physicians looking at this patient said, you know what, there's a few things that are favoring SVT with a bundle. Number one, he's relatively young. He's only 45. He's got no known history of cardiac disease. He's hemodynamically stable. And they were thinking that a heart rate of 180 is maybe a little bit too fast for normal VTAC. And I've heard that a number of times before. I don't know where it comes from, but if you are under the impression that a heart rate of 180 is too fast for VTAC, just get rid of it now because there's no heart rate, which is ever too fast for the ventricle. The ventricle can beat as fast as it darn well pleases. There's a few things on the 12 lead also that were making them think this is an SVT. Up top, you see that there's maybe a taller right rabbit ear compared to the left rabbit ear. I learned that that favors SVT with right bundle. In lead AVR, there's a QR type of pattern. And then also in a couple of leads, it, it appears that there's little retrograde P waves, which is very typical for an AV nodal reentry tachycardia. In other words, an SVT, the most common type of SVT. So based on some clinical factors and those ECG factors we reviewed, they diagnosed SVT with the right bundle. All right, so what do they do? They gave a couple doses of adenosine, six and then 12. It didn't work. And so they thought, well, let's try some amiodarone. They give an amiodarone bolus, it doesn't work. Then they try some other AV nodal blockers, two doses of metoprolol. And after the second dose, blood pressure falls to 60, the patient becomes lethargic, at which point they immediately tried to defib or cardiovert the patient. The patient loses pulses, they ended up defibrillating the patient. Fortunately, the patient got their pulses back. And after they changed their underwear, they ended up admitting the patient to the hospital where cardiology and electrophysiology confirmed that this was actually ventricular tachycardia from the start. And the patient ended up needing to get an AICD. Now, unfortunately, there was a lot of fallout from this case. Again, remember the background of what type of emergency department this was. There was a lot of fallout from cardiology and from the hospital. And after this near disastrous case, the hospital made a decision that these emergency physicians were no longer ever allowed to take care of an acute arrhythmia without calling cardiology first. Now, at nighttime, I don't know if that still applied, but anyway, imagine the level of respect you're striving for when a type of case like this ends up happening. Why does this keep happening? I mean, we've all learned in 
any type of residency that you've done, except maybe orthopedics, everybody learns that any wide complex tachycardia should be thought of as VTAC until proven otherwise. And when in doubt, you're supposed to assume that you're looking at ventricular tachycardia whenever you have a regular wide complex tachycardia. Again, despite that, I still keep seeing cases over and over and over of regular wide complex tachycardias where the assumption is it's got to be an SVT. And I, I just can't get past that. I don't understand it. Let me share with you a few cases that have been sent to me just within the past year. Here's a 52-year-old woman who comes in with chest heaviness. Here's the 12 lead. And because this patient was hemodynamically stable, they ended up diagnosing an SVT. Fortunately, the patient didn't have a disastrous outcome. But the patient was later confirmed to have VTAC and I believe ended up getting an AICD. And I've listed up there a few things on the 12 lead, which absolutely nail the diagnosis or should have nailed the diagnosis of VTAC. There's extreme right axis. There's a taller left rabbit ear in V1. The R to S interval is greater than 100 milliseconds. That's called Burgata sign, by the way, if you want to look that up. And in V6, the patient has a much larger S wave. All of these four things have been very strongly shown to favor ventricular tachycardia, yet the initial thought was, well, she's stable, so it must be an SVT. Here's a 79-year-old woman. 79 years old, do we even need to talk about this? Right, well, 79 years old, comes in with palpitations, blood pressure was okay, and so the assumption was that this was SVT. Well, there's a couple of things on this 12 lead, again, that nailed the diagnosis of VTAC, and in the EP lab later, this was shown to be ventricular tachycardia. Here's a 90-year-old man, 90 years old, uh, who comes in and take a look at these risk factors. He's had a previous PCI with an LAD obstruction. He's got right ventricular failure, severe, severe pulmonary hypertension, AFib, aortic valve replacement. He's got a pacemaker. You know what? If this patient came to my emergency department just to deliver flowers, I would admit him to the hospital. Yet, because his only complaint was palpitations, Here's the 12 lead, by the way, because he was hemodynamically stable without much other complaint. The assumption was, well, if this were VTAC, a 90-year-old would have to be unstable. And because he's stable, it's got to be SVT. And so he ended up being treated and ended up having a brief decompensation when he was treated for SVT. And this was later proven to be ventricular tachycardia. And the patient ended up getting an AICD later, unfortunately didn't die, but very nearly could have because the initial assumption was that this was SVT. He ended up getting amiodarone after a couple doses of simple beta blockers crashed, amiodarone didn't help, and he ended up being shocked out of it. <clears throat> Again, why does this keep on happening? I think one of the reasons this keeps happening is because we keep getting more and more literature explaining to us how to make this distinction between SVT and VTAC. Here's an article from 2020, another one from 2020. Here's one from 2021. Here's one from 2022. Article after article after article saying, hey, you know what? We can look at the 12 lead and make the distinction. And I've got to tell you that as much as I love electrocardiography, there's no reliable way of making this distinction on 12 lead. You can't do it. And for years and years, people have tried to do that. And the reality is that although the ECG is great at ruling in VTAC, the ECG is not reliable at coming up with things that rule out ventricular tachycardia. And that's the reason why for decades, we've all been taught that when somebody has a regular wide complex tachycardia, <clears throat> you should always prove or assume that it's VTAC. Whenever in doubt, just assume and treat it as ventricular tachycardia. And honestly, you should always have some level of doubt. People continue publishing different algorithms the Brugada algorithm, Beige and Griffith and so on. And you all have heard many of these. Probably the very best study ever looking at how good these different algorithms are was this European electrophysiology study by Jastrzewski. And in this study, what Jastrzewski and colleagues did was they looked at 260 wide complex tachycardias. 159 were actual proven cases of VTAC. And they ran them through these algorithms. Now they had <clears throat> board certified cardiologists, open book format, take your time, drink your coffee, no rush at all, which is not what we're doing in the emergency department, right? But they're taking their time in an open book format, running these 260 wide complex tachycardias through these algorithms. 
How good were the algorithms at picking up the proven cases of VTAC? We'll take a look at these numbers. Brugada algorithm missed 11%. Griffith algorithm was the best, worst specificity, but it still missed 6%. And some of the numbers are even worse than that. <clears throat> now, remember, this is a diagnosis which is deadly if you miss the diagnosis, yet if you make the diagnosis, there's a fantastic outcome in treatment. So this is something that we've got to be nearly 100% sensitive at. We can't afford to miss any of these cases. And yet even the very best algorithms are missing anywhere from 6 to 40%. And that's why I say that although there are many reliable criteria that rule in VTAC, there are no reliable criteria that rule it out. And so when you see a regular wide complex tachycardia, you've got to just call it ventricular tachycardia. And here we are in 2023, and somebody's put out yet another algorithm, this one coming from Mayo, Mayo Clinic VTAC Calculator. Now, in this article, just to let you know a little bit about what this said, what they did was they said, you know what, let's take the humans out of this. What you do is you take the 12 lead ECG and you just plug in a few intervals, the QRS the, uh, and the T wave axis intervals with the new 12 lead and also the baseline 12 lead. And so that can be a problem because you have to have the baseline 12 lead also. Anyway, you plug this into this uh, web-based mobile computer platform. And once you do that, the computer will spit out a probability of what's the likelihood that this new 12 lead is actually ventricular tachycardia. <clears throat> Example I'm showing up here, it's 98%. So yeah, go ahead and treat it as VTAC. Well, let me ask you this. What if you plug in all the numbers and the computer says that there's a 30% likelihood of VTAC? Are you going to go ahead and treat it as SVT? What, what if the computer says there's a 10 or 15% likelihood of ventricular tachycardia? In other words, it's 85% likely this is SVT. Are you going to treat them as SVT and take a chance, a 15% chance that you might be wrong and end up killing the patient? Hey, we're only 12 minutes into this 49-minute video by Dr. Matu to see how he resolves this case. And for all the ECG research goodness from the past year, make sure to go to journalfeed.org and subscribe to the Journalfeed Top Picks video series. Or if you're a Silver Spoon member, you can upgrade to Gold or you can get the Gold Spoon membership, which includes this entire video series, which has 10 CME credits. And for Gold Spoon members, you can get an additional 36 CME credits per year, plus all the goodness that JournalFeed has to offer. So go to journalfeed.org and subscribe today.